commercial free Catholic charismatic channel. He's strengthening the faith of so many people. To promote the gift of church teaching. Dedicated for the new evangelization. God's blessings on your work, may God bless and prosper you. Shalom World, God's own channel. Let us take a moment and gather our thoughts in prayer as we enter into the presence of the Lord and reflect upon his goodness in our lives during this season of Lent. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In 1948, Joseph Campbell published a book titled The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And in this book, he explored the theory that the hero myths from all the cultures in all the worlds, all over the world, actually share a common structure. He referred to this structure as the monomyth. Now, this is the way the monomyth plays out. A hero has a growing awareness that there's a problem, that something isn't quite right, a, a sense of discontent. He hears a call. Usually, he refuses the call at first, but eventually, he answers the call. And when he answers the call, he travels from his natural world into a supernatural world. He overcomes obstacles and difficulties with the help of teachers and guides. He achieves a victory. He receives revelation which transforms him. And then he returns to his natural world endowed with supernatural gifts which he uses to help others. We should not be surprised that these hero stories from all over the world share a common structure because they are all attempts to retell the story that is common to all of humanity. All of the hero stories you've ever heard are actually symbolic stories of our own spiritual journey. We are the heroes of an epic spiritual quest, a quest to find God. We are the peasants who find that we are the sons and daughters of a king. We are the armored knights fighting the dragons of fear and doubt in our quest to find God. Even pre-Christian cultures were aware of this story, and they told it as best they could. This is the way the Catechism of the Catholic Church explains it. The coming of God's Son to earth is an event of such immensity that God willed to prepare for it over centuries. He makes everything converge on Christ, all the rituals and sacrifices, figures and symbols of the first covenant. He announces him through the mouths of the prophets who succeed one another in Israel. Moreover, he awakens in the hearts of the pagans a dim expectation of his coming. This monomyth of Professor Campbell is a template for our own spiritual journey. Now, we can take almost any story and chart those milestones of, of the hero's quest. But for our Lenten retreat, let's look at how they line up in the Gospel of Mark. The hero's quest starts with a awakening that there's a problem, that something isn't quite right. The Gospel of Mark starts with John the Baptist calling the people to repent for their sins and to beg forgiveness. And so people examine their lives and where they are in the context of their relationship with God and find that they come up short. And so they come to John the Baptist to be baptized so that their sins may be forgiven. For us, we, have a, we experience a growing awareness that something is not quite right in our lives. We may have achieved all that we set out to achieve in terms of the material world, the secular world, all the success that the world tells us that we must strive for. We may have the house, the family, the great job, money in the bank, but we still have this sense that we're missing something, that something isn't quite right. We actually have to reach this point before we're ready for the next step. It's when we have distanced ourselves from God as far as we possibly can that we are ready to hear his call. Dante Alighieri, in his Divine Comedy, his very first book starts with this sense. And the Inferno, the Inferno starts out with these words. In the midway of this our mortal life, I found me in a gloomy wood astray, gone from the path direct. Sometimes this is referred to as a midlife crisis. But this midlife crisis can happen to us at any time in our lives, no matter where we are, no matter our age or where we are in our career paths. 
The next step in the hero's quest is hearing the call of God. When we reach this point of discontent, when we begin to wonder if there isn't more to our lives, if we wonder if this is all that there is or if we're doing what we should be doing, that is when we are ready to hear God calling us. In the gospel according to Mark, God calls the people in a very dramatic way. They've all gathered to be baptized by John and Jesus appears in their midst, insisting that John baptize him. And when he comes up out of the water, the gospel of Mark tells us, and when he came up out of the water, immediately saw the heavens opened and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, thou art my beloved son, with thee I am well pleased. God actually calls us all the time, but we usually can't hear him because of the noise and confusion in our lives. And he calls us in many different ways. He calls us in as many ways as there are people in the world. Have you ever seen a sunset that was so beautiful that just for a moment you stood transfixed? Everything else went away and that moment seemed to last for an eternity. It's a moment of transcendence, where you're, a moment where you're touching the eternal. And you have a feeling that's difficult to describe. The, the best way you can describe it is a feeling of homesickness, a longing for something you once had and want to reclaim. Or perhaps you had this experience when you looked at the face of your child who's fallen asleep on your lap. And when you look at that face that's all innocence and purity, everything else goes away. You almost stand outside of yourself and have a moment of transcendence. Or perhaps you have a more dramatic experience with God, a family tragedy, or an experience with the supernatural that you can't explain. Surveys actually tell us that people have these experiences of the supernatural Quite often, they just don't like to talk about them openly. So we've received God's call. Our next step is to answer that call. Very frequently, our first instinct is to refuse that call, mostly because we don't want to leave our comfort zone. That call challenges us to go into something that we're unfamiliar with. But once we have gotten to the point where we can hear God calling us, we find that God calls us all the time. And eventually, he wears us down, and we answer that call. We travel from what is known to us to what is unknown. In the gospel, Jesus calls Simon, who will be Peter, and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John, and Levi. And they leave what they are doing and follow him immediately. The force of Jesus' personality is so strong that when he calls someone, they stop what they are doing and they leave everything they've known and venture off to follow someone they barely know. That's what it means when we answer God's call. We travel from what we've known from our comfort zone to what we don't know. And we set off into a vast new world to explore. In the hero's journey, this is where he crosses from the natural world into the supernatural world. We don't travel into another world per se. We stay in the world we're in, but we can begin to see that the supernatural is all around us. Father Andrew Greeley, in his book, The Catholic Imagination, describes the world of Catholics this way. Catholics live in an enchanted world, a world of statues and holy water, stained glass and votive candles, saints and religious medals, rosary beads and holy pictures. But these Catholic paraphernalia are mere hints of a deeper and more pervasive religious sensibility, which inclines Catholics to see the holy lurking in creation. As Catholics, we find our houses and our world haunted by a sense that the objects, events, and persons of daily life are revelations of grace. When we answer God's call and set off into the unknown, two things happen to us immediately. Like the heroes in the stories, we encounter obstacles, which we need to overcome. In the hero stories, these are the dragons, the witches, and the evil spirits that the heroes must battle to overcome before they can achieve their victory. In the gospel, the disciples experienced fear and doubt. When they were in a boat and threatened with being capsized in a storm, they appealed to Jesus who had fallen asleep in the boat. Teacher, do you not care if we perish? And he awoke and re rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? A little while later, Jesus feeds 5,000 men with five loaves of bread. And again, the disciples are in a boat and they see Jesus walking on the water. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. 
for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, have no fear. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. The disciples were not immune to fear and doubt, and even the human nature of Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. For our part, the obstacles that we overcome all come from within us. Our Lord himself tells us in Mark's gospel, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. These things that come from within us all conspire to make us forget who we are and what we are about. They try to draw us away from the path that we are on. The second thing that happens to us when we embark on this journey is that we meet with teachers and with guides. The disciples, of course, had our Lord in the flesh teaching, him, teaching them about the kingdom in the form of parables. We still have the words of Jesus in scripture, but we also have our own teachers and guides and friends to help us along the way. We have the world that God created for us to learn from. We may even be taught by here in the form of quotes or a phrase that we overhear at exactly the right time that we need to. This portion of the spiritual journey is all about learning to see with new eyes. Throughout Mark's gospel, Jesus is encouraging us to see. He tells us, having eyes do you not, do you not see, and having ears do you not hear. The gospels encourage us constantly to open our eyes and see the world around us. Learning to see with new eyes means to change our perspective of the world, to change the way we see things. Author Stephen Covey wrote a classic book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in that book, he tells a story. He tells of one morning on a New York subway. It's a very calm, peaceful scene. Some people are lost in thought, some people are reading newspapers, and some people are just leaning their heads back with their eyes closed, enjoying the peace of the moment. A man comes into, a, into the subway car with his children, and the children immediately start running up and down the car, yelling at each other, throwing things, and grabbing people's newspapers. The father sits down next to Mr. Covey and does nothing. After a while, Covey turns to the father with what he describes as great patience and restraint, and says to the man, sir, your children are being very disruptive and disturbing a lot of people. Don't you think you could control them a little more? And the man wakes up as if he's seen the situation for the first time and says, oh, you're right, I guess I should do something. You see, we just came from the hospital about an hour ago where their mother died. I guess they don't know how to handle it and I don't know what to think either. Suddenly Covey's entire perspective of the event changed. He felt differently, he acted differently, he spoke differently. His annoyance was replaced by compassion for the man. Your wife just died. Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you tell me about it? What can I do to help? To learn to see the world with new eyes means to learn to see how we can help others. We give up our self-centeredness, our egos, and we learn to see what we can do for other people. The challenges and the testings continue in this part of the journey until we are ready to meet God. In the Gospels, just before the victory, the last challenge comes in the form of a question. Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? The people who do not know Jesus have the wrong idea of him. They think he's John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets, but Peter, and the disciples who have been formed by Christ, who have learned from him, who have learned to see the world with new eyes, see things differently. Peter declares, you are the Christ. Peter has learned that the Messiah will not come as a general who will lead the armies of Israel against the Romans. Peter has learned that the Messiah comes as a humble shepherd, gathering the lost sheep. For our part in this journey, 
When we reach this point, we find that all this time that we've been searching for God, God has been searching for us. After this victory comes a revelation, a transformation. In the gospel, this is the transfiguration, the middle of, of the gospel of Mark. This is the high point of the gospel of Mark. Peter takes James and John, excuse me, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the top of the mountain and reveals to them his glory. This is referred to as a mountaintop experience. Have you ever been to the top of a mountain? When I was younger, I used to go on skiing trips with our local park and rec district. They had Saturday uh, day-long ski trips. And I remember a few times getting off the chairlift or the gondola at the top of the highest mountain and looking just for a moment before I started skiing down at the, the, the scenery before me. It felt like I was on the roof of the world with all of creation spread out at my feet. I saw other mountains wreathed in smoke, smoke clouds rather, Clouds are a symbol of God's presence. Scripture tells us that God lives on the mountaintops and prophets would climb to their summits to speak with him. Even today, people who ski or people who climb mountains will tell you that on the top of the mountain, they feel closer to God. This mountaintop experience, this encounter with God transforms us. It strengthens us for what lies ahead. There's a story in the second book of Kings that gives us an idea of what's going on during the transfiguration. At the time, Israel was at war with Syria. And the prophet Elisha used his divinely inspired sight to inform the Israeli army of the tactics and strategies of the Syrians. At first, the Syrian king thought that a spy was responsible. But eventually, he learned the truth and sent his army to capture Elisha. Now, Elisha lived in a city called Dothan, near the top of a mountain. And during the night, the armies of the Syrians surrounded the mountain. In the morning, Elisha's servant gets up, looks out, and his heart must have just quailed within him because he saw the army of the Syrians camped all around the city. And out of fear for the safety and concern of his master, he ran to Elisha and said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elisha tells him, Fear not, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Remember the words of Paul. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, it's understandable that the servant wasn't quite comforted by these words because he still saw this army surrounding them. So Elisha prays to God, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And God opens the eyes of the servant, and the servant sees that between them and the Syrian army are horses and chariots of fire covering the mountainside. At this point in his ministry, Jesus is very much like Elisha. And Peter is very much like the servant. Peter needs to be reassured. After his declaration that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus begins to tell his disciples about his coming passion and death. This doesn't sit well with Peter. No, Lord, this will never happen to you. So Jesus takes Peter to the mountaintop where Peter experiences the divine revelation of God. Elijah and Moses are there, representing the prophets and the law, the old covenant deferring to the new. And Peter is strengthened for what lies ahead. In 1968, Martin Luther King gave a keynote address, and it ended with these words. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. Those were the last words to his followers. The next day he was killed by an assassin's bullet. But those words were full, so full of hope and reassurance that it allowed his followers to continue with their mission without the person that had brought them so far. For our spiritual journey, we also have that mountaintop experience. We have the Mass. We have the Sacrament of the Eucharist, where we gather to hear the Word of God proclaimed to us, just as Peter heard God speaking to him, telling him to listen to Jesus. When we gather for the Sacrament, we see our transfigured Lord in the form of bread and wine. And by receiving the Eucharist, we are strengthened and reassured to go out into the world and preach the Gospel and to help others. 
just as Peter was strengthened and reassured for the dark days that lay ahead. He was strengthened to go out and preach the gospel to the world and lead the church that was just at that moment beginning. Peter returns from the mountain with these spiritual gifts. What gifts do we return with? Actually, they're the same gifts that we've always had. But having been on this journey, we've learned to see with new eyes. We've learned to see the world in a new way. And we've learned that the gifts that we've been given are not given for our sake. They're given for us to help our brothers and sisters. And so we return, seeing all of the supernatural wonder that is around us. We return to become guides and teachers for other people so that they may be have their own spiritual journey so they may have their own experience with God and return to be guides and teachers of other people. During Lent, it is common for us to go on retreats or to observe special practices. We do these things because we have that growing sense of awareness that something is not quite right in our lives. Lent is a time for us to examine where we are on this spiritual journey to examine our relationship with God and how we have responded to God. During Lent, take time to let God guide you and teach you. Let him form you. Let him teach you to learn to see the world with new eyes. And then on Easter, you will experience the transfiguration of the revelation of the glory of the Lord. You will be transformed and you will return you will return home with the gifts that you have been given because now you have seen that they are given to you to use to help other people. This spiritual quest we are on, this epic journey, will last our entire life. And we will go through the various stages over and over again. We always have that mountaintop experience available to us in the sacrament of the Eucharist. We will experience highs and lows. We will experience the highs of the mountaintop and we will experience the lows of passing through the valleys of the shadow of death. And sometimes we will lose the path entirely. But Lent is the perfect time for us to find that path again and resume our journey. May Almighty God bless us all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Shalom Tidings. This is good news for a new generation. Discover God's constant presence amidst the hopelessness in our lives. Tiffany Layton writes about losing her young husband to horrific violence in Clinging to the Cross. God's grace showed Anne Noel how to be a merciful woman. Brother Manis Matus tells us why misery, pain, and suffering can indeed be a gift. Lisa Duffy shares her experiences in escaping the dangers of the divorce culture. Patty Knapp understands the infinite value of having a mass said, and so much more. Read about how God gives hope for the heartbroken in the February-March 2015 issue of Shalom Tidings. Visit shalomworld.org forward slash tidings. Also available in Barnes & Noble stores, 